There's an expression, if you're piloting an aircraft, then there's the takeoff, there's the part in between, and the approach is always memorable, demanding, and working with Mike is like being on the approach all the time. <laughs> and that's the greatest compliment that I can pay Mike. He's very demanding, and um, there's also another aviation expression, and that is whether you're behind the aircraft, and the aircraft is kind of running away, or whether you're on top of the aircraft and in control. And Mike is always wonderfully one step ahead. So that's what it's like working with Mike. <laughs> <laughs> so intense. Um, Ricky, let me start off with you. We touched on climate change. We touched on, uh, of course, this interconnectivity. Talk to me about safety and security. The Manchester attacks were a reminder that cities and urban planning needs to also add this new dimension. Ricky. Well, I think security, safety, you know, as we speak these days, is, is a fundamental question that we're all worried about. But I want to respond to that question, slightly widening it up, because if I hear what Mike's been saying, I hear what Norman has been saying, the fact, and we heard it from Manuela, from the mayor of Madrid, the fact that cities are fundamentally democratic institutions is something that needs to be protected and upheld. And I actually think the issue of security and safety is behind that. Because if, histories over t if cities sorry, over time have been about bringing together people who are different, think of New York, think of London, think of many other cities around the world, which actually thrive on people from different backgrounds, managing that difference, managing people who come from different backgrounds is what good leadership is also about. Norman already showed some slides, that famous slide <coughs> of uh, uh, Sao Paulo, where on one side you have an area with uh, no water, no infrastructure. On the other side, it's so rich that you've got uh, skyscrapers with swimming pools on each terrace. The more I do work around the world, Francine, the more I see, unfortunately, cities with walls around people who belong to one group rather than another. I think our biggest challenge when it comes to the questions of solving security and maintaining openness and democracy is to avoid that. You don't solve problems of integration, and obviously this is a bigger point and not just about cities, by building walls, but by having open systems which actually allow people to connect and dialogue, and the design, as Norman has said, is fundamental to that equation. And let me add something. When uh, after 9-11, Norman built the first new skyscrapers, the Hearst Building, that was right after 9-11. And I'll never forget Ken Chenault, who runs American Express, coming to see me. I had been elected but not taken office. And he said they would, American Express was located downtown, really just across the street from the World Trade Center disaster. And he said, we are going to stay in this city. We're going to stay right where we are. We're going to keep growing here. And I said, can I go out and say it? And I made a big deal of it, but here's a company that has faith in America, faith in New York, willing to say to people, yes, there are risks, but we can overcome those. And of course, the New York Times wrote a story about the cost of using an American Express card versus MasterCard, but uh, only the Times could do that one. <laughs> Norman Foster, do, do you believe, and then I'll get to mine in a second, do you believe that actually urban planning and architecture is, is maybe becoming more politicized? I, I think that the best examples of cities have had powerful injections of, of planning um, to create a structure which gives the potential for informal, unplanned developments. I mean, Paris at the turn of the century was one of the worst vice-ridden cities and Napoleon commissioned Haussmann, and the Paris as we know it was a planning initiative. And I find it fascinating that some of the, uh, the cities in the, in the West seem to have forgotten the power of planning. And that's been exported as something from the past into emerging economies. 
So I think Mike's point about the need for strong leadership and a degree of planning, but also a planning that allows a kind of energy of the private sector to develop within it. And, and some luck too. We had the luck of having rivers that kept Manhattan from expanding geographically, and so you had to go up. And that's why efficiency, it's so efficient because everybody walks and takes mass transit. The roads may be plugged with cars, but there aren't very many of them if you really count compared to the number of people. So we were lucky with that. Maya, you started designing at, at a very young age. How have you decided to balance your art, but also your architectural careers? I'll, I'll get to that in a second. I want to get back to cities for a second, because I do think that one of the things is there's a huge divide, as Norman said, between when cities were built around people and the pedestrian and the cities of the 20th century that really are the ones that have been created and formed by the car. So if we get back to what the humanism of a true city is, that's what we're beginning to really tackle with in density issues. So as we deal with urban infill, with maximizing density, it's almost like we have to take and learn from the lessons of the past as our transportation revolution goes through a massive revolution as we get back to kind of one-on-one -on -one contact, which I think gets to be a very interesting discussion point with how we connect one person to another in a way. And I think fundamentally that fascination with, um, it's almost like going back to almost a 60s, 70s approach to how we were trained as architects. It's, there was this great book by Rasmussen about how a building feels. And we don't really talk about it. We went into deep theory at some point. But if we almost go back to the psychology of spaces and how a lot of what a city offers us is community building and that one-on-one -on -one contact, which in a way with the new transportation revolution is even going to take the 20th century cities and begin to get us back to almost that very personal, intimate level which a city can give us. But Ricky, not every city is created equal. Right? So there are different demands, there are different needs for every city. Um, is there a template that you would say actually fits most big metropolises around the world? That, that one. A, a template, like a blueprint, that, that you feel all big cities could follow and it would work for them? Well, first of all, I don't think a discussion about cities is one size fits all. I think Norman made that clear. You can't apply the same solutions to new cities in China uh, as you can to retrofitting the European city, New York, or wherever it is. What I would say in linking your point about compression of scale, which is a very interesting notion, cities are not just big avenues. They're not just big, they are infrastructure, but they're not just infrastructure. They're about bringing people closer together in an intimate way. Is the public space of the city and what you can do about it. Some of the great lessons, you talked about Bogota, in Latin America, I know Alejandro Aravena will be speaking about this later. Some of the great lessons come from a city like Medellin. Medellin was the murder rate capital of the world. I mean, the highest murder rate you could have anywhere. Because of a number of public space interventions and art interventions, for example, turning infrastructure like the places that you use for storing water into a little public park with water around it, uh, it's actually brought the <clears throat> level of homicides down to one of the lowest in Latin America. You now have tours to go there. So I'm a great believer in your point of the small things can make big changes. And in that sense, Francine, you can't have one size fits all in terms of uh, you need the bigger picture, but you need the compression and the scale. <coughs> and, and um, the issue of water and agriculture and that massive component. I mean, if you took the livestock industry out, the, the, it's the equivalent of everything that moves, every vehicle, every truck, every, every ship. And if you see the emergence of solar, then you're not getting fertilizer as a byproduct of fossil fuel processing. And the green belt around London has been incredibly powerful in terms of the quality of life and it's also had the same effect, Mike, uh, as the kind of peninsula of New York. It's ensured that London has developed more intensely where it should do at its heart. If you, if you take the fertilizer away, you wonder why you're producing all your agriculture 
the products in a remote place where there's no fertilizer and where there's no water. The logical place to develop agriculture, to green the city, is the city. Because it's got those sewers with an abundance of water and fertilizer. So you don't even need to worry about whether you should be high-rise greening or surrounding the city with, with greenery. So the city can become more sustainable, consume less energy, and be more beautiful. And, you're, and it's local produce. Speaking of greenery, uh, again, another thing with um, so many people uh, right on the coasts, I think within 200 miles, that with rising seas, another very economic way, and I think many cities are implementing this, are restoring wetlands, actually building new wetlands, um, mangroves, so that literally, if wetlands sequester three times as much carbon as a tropical forest, you have absolutely one of the most economic ways to help break wave action, give people back um, beautiful parklands along, along the ocean. And the third thing, which again, I love when things are beginning to really integrate and we begin to think of climate change as a more holistic problem that we have to solve holistically. Um, we can save three birds with one tree, we can increase biodiversity. Which again, after Stern's report on climate change, he said biodiversity loss is a crisis that is equal or at sometimes worse in a lot of ways. And this is one way where you could both reduce emissions and increase biodiversity and protect communities. Mike, does infrastructure challenges or, um, actually affect, or urban planning affect social equality in cities? Yes, you have to have transportation, for example, so that people can get to their jobs. And if you, don't, if you live in a neighborhood where you don't have that, you don't have a job. And Medellin is actually a good example. Medellin, if you don't know, is this long valley with very steep hills on it. And all of the poor live up on the hills and there was no ways for them to get down to the jobs. And what they built is these uh, um, telephoriques or whatever you call them, and uh, like you have a, a cabin that goes up a ski lift. Now people can get up and down, and they've built some railroads that go up. But you have to empower people and give them the ability to do that. Infrastructure is also uh, schools, education. In the end, the only solution for poor people, and I'm not sure it's enough, but the first thing is getting them an education, and we, at least in America, are going in the wrong direction. Uh, our education system is falling behind the world and actually going down in absolute terms as well. And uh, it's just a disgrace, but if we don't give poor people an education, they have no chance. The real problem for the world is whether they're going to be jobs even if you have an education because technology is giving everybody better products at lower prices, but it's destroying the jobs that they used to create the less, pro less valuable products, uh, less useful products, and uh, having much better uh, consumer goods at the expense of destabilizing society may not be a good trade-off. I think uh, what is behind Michael's point is uh, <clears throat> complete relationship and connection between investment in infrastructure, transport, and social equity. And I think this is something we need to re-understand again. We did it well in the 19th century. We haven't done it very well for the last 40 or 50 years because the sorts of investments we're talking about, say, Crossrail in London, which is a massive project which starts next year, it will link the poorest parts of London, which in our case is east, so the, in the edge, to jobs and other yeah circumstances, and that's fundamental. In, in the last couple of decades, if you want to get, if you're depressed and you want to have a smile on your face, just think about this. In the last few decades, we've reduced global poverty by 50% if you measure it by going to bed with a meal in your stomach, a roof over your head, and being able to read. No. And it's virtually all in the third world where we went in and natural resources were their export. Now, they may not get paid very well, but at least they have jobs, and they have moved up the chain. No is where you want them to be or where they want to be, but going in the right direction. And if we walk away from global trade, and thanks to America and maybe not just us, uh, people are shying away from global trade, that does not bode well for those who were helped before. They could certainly slip back. And we, who are so smug that think we have it all, are not going to have it all if we stop this.
Norman Foster, how difficult is it to retrofit existing cities? So changing cities that are already vibrant but big and huge and adapt them to some of the challenges that you were mentioning. I think that the, it's, it's, it's parallel challenges. It's the what form the new urbanization takes, whether it learns from the lessons uh, historically in terms of uh, the traditional city rather than the carbon city. Um, I, I, as, as existing cities uh, respond to the transportation revolution, uh, I would see them becoming more pedestrian friendly, um, less congested, cleaner and quieter. Um, of course, the side effects of the transport revolution, I think there are six million professional drivers in America um, in no time at all. You know, what are they going to, to be doing? Um, and also the way in which artificial intelligence in transport, so these driverless cars, there's no reason why they don't touch each other and become like one long train. Um, and what does that do to the insurance business? If cars then become so safe because you've taken away human error, it's like the automation in terms of aircraft. It's pilot error that is responsible for almost all air tragedies. So when you take that out, I think you're seeing huge transformations in, in, the, in the job chain. Yeah, I mean, you should take a look at what Elon Musk is doing. I went out to see him. He uh, makes Teslas, but he also, uh, SpaceX is his company, where he has just gone in the private sector without enormous investment from the federal government and replaced NASA. And every rocket that goes up now, or almost every one, is a SpaceX rocket. And he is moving so fast that it's hard to see how big companies like Boeing and Lockheed, who are building one big rocket, can possibly <laughs> keep up. But also, he thinks about other things. He dug a hole right outside his factory, which is near the Los Angeles airport. He went out and bought a used tunnel borer from some city dropped it down in there, and he put some of his engineers on there, ripping it apart and seeing how they can make it better. And he wants to build a tunnel from Los Angeles to San Francisco, where you can get a pneumatic tube and be there in 30 minutes. Now, it sounds like a stupid idea, except as you pointed out, who would have thought we have an iPhone in our hand right now? It may not be that stupid, but it's that kind of innovation that is taking place by a handful of very smart people and really are disrupting so many of the traditional things that we've done. And you should be proud because you've been doing a lot of the same things that, that Elon has. Jeff Bezos is another one who's just changed the whole world. Now, the way people are shopping today, and it doesn't, it's not just Amazon, uh, um, uh, Alibaba and other companies that copy the same thing, but giving people a better ways to do what they traditionally have always done, and most of us never thought that there was a different ways of doing it, and all of a sudden, somebody comes along and says, you don't have to go into the store. And you don't have to uh, um, have the, uh, stand in line for return policy and the, those kinds of things. You don't have, you, you can all of a sudden compare prices from every store. You go into Macy's, you look at it and you hit your iPhone, ah, it's, it's available cheaper next door. And just, and, and you don't have to go next door, you hit a button and you buy it from the store next door while you're standing in Macy's. <laughs> and so you say, okay, what about all, the, about all the people who work in Macy's? What are they gonna do? And that's a very good question. In the United States, we talk about the president has made a big deal about coal mining jobs, all of which are gonna go away, no matter what he says, that just, you can't stop that. The technology's being uh, automated, but also everybody's gonna stop using coal, because for the first time, renewables really are already cheaper and gonna get even more cheap. But people in the retail business who are being put out of work, what are they gonna do? I don't have a good answer to that, nor does anybody else that I've heard. Maya? Well, I think one of the things, and again, as we move forward and things are shuffling, um, as far as job creation, it has been proven that whether it's renewables or actually no-till reformed agriculture, there are incredible growth and income growth in those sectors 
as well as, I'm, I just run statistics as part of what is missing. For every million dollars spent, you get about five to six jobs in, coal, in oil and gas. You get about seven to eight in coal, but those aren't going to last. You get 30 to 40 in a national park. So what, you know, I'm going to think a little outside of the box. I keep thinking Bhutan's annual per capita carbon footprint is minus 14 tons, partly because of hydro, but mostly because of carbon offsets through forests. West Virginia would make an incredible Smoky Mountain connected park, and it would bring a lot of jobs back. And these have, there have been extensive studies done about how these open space areas are incredible engines for economic growth. Art and culture the same way. For very little investment, you get an incredible return on that investment. So I think as long as we're thinking and talking about, I mean, I walk through the streets of Manhattan, every fourth or fifth retail shop is closing and no one's talking about it. And I'm going, we have to both embrace and understand and try to really bring people along with these revolutions in all these different sectors. And I think climate change offers us that time where we can create incredible job opportunities in renewables and in, in buildings and in, uh, and in resiliency. Norman Foster, Maya was talking about revolution. Uh, Mike was talking about visionaries. How difficult is it to be a visionary and an architect? Some of the foundations that you used for the Apple campus and from Bloomberg headquarters, you had the basis, what, 40, 50 years ago, but it's taken such a long time to actually have a project that allows it. Uh, I got um, um, a letter uh, from uh, a student. Uh, and the student said, I'd read that you said as an architect, you have no power. Um, and, um, and you're right, I'm really becoming kind of cynical. And, uh, and I wrote back and I said, when I said that I had no power, it meant that I couldn't say, I wanted to create this building or build that road. You're not Mike Bloomberg. Um, <laughs> but I said, you know, take heart, don't misunderstand me. You have tremendous power. You have the power of advocacy. Um, and, and in the end, I think it comes down to Mike as a, as a leader. That's the power. I mean, Mike can do his building, but as mayor of New York, he can't physically go and build a road or change that. Or that. He can only do it by leadership, by advocacy, and by intelligence. I think you said something in your book. If you can't measure it, you can't manage it. And so it's the application of intelligence. It's not how much money you spend. It's how wisely you spend it. Uh, and that's the, that's the power of <clears throat> different disciplines coming together and interacting. That's the equivalent in the kind of cycling world of the peloton. The peloton can go faster and longer as a group than the individual rider. Yeah, I, nobody does anything by themselves. I've always thought if we cure cancer, uh, I've given a lot of money, as have the Kochs and a number of other foundations and people, to doing research. And the Nobel Prize may go to the person that discovered the cure, but the rest of us have a share in that Nobel Prize. And I think the same thing is true with your genius in building a building. Somebody's got to want it. Somebody's got to either come up with an idea or believe in you and let you go do it when everybody says, well, it shouldn't be that expensive or it shouldn't be that avant-garde or it shouldn't use the space so inefficiently or efficiently depending on how you define it, that sort of thing. And so it, you know, it, it's a project that a lot of people are involved in. You know, the construction company that says to you, Norman, we should move this over here, and you didn't think about that before, or it reduces the cost or makes something else possible. It's those things. We, I've always given lectures to young kids, get rid of the words I and me and replace them with we and us, because I don't know anything that any of us certainly up here in this uh, podium do uh, or any place else where you do it by yourself. I, I think behind the things you're both saying, there, there is a, a caution, which is actually, like, if you go, if the kid changes the language and they then go to university and train to be an architect, an engineer, or something or something else, a planner, 
Unfortunately, most of the education systems still work in silos. Yep. So many of the conversations we're having here do not happen within those worlds that shape the new professionals, and actually the worst of the professional institutions, some of whom are represented here. I'm sure there are a lot of students of architecture in this room, in Madrid and elsewhere around the world, who actually don't get exposed to some of these issues, and that's why this foundation is so interesting. Mike, do you think the pace of change for cities will be faster than we've seen before because of technological advancement? Well, the estimates are that there'll be more new technology in the next five or ten years than from Thomas Edison to today. So if you just think about that, it is really scary. And I don't know what's going tomorrow's innovation is going to be. All I know is there's going to be lots of them and they're going to come quicker. And I go back and think about my mother. Uh, she lived 102 years, died about five years ago. But in her lifetime, number one, she'd lived roughly ha a third of the time that America's been in existence. She started out remembering uh, electricity coming into the apartment that she lived in and gas lights going out back in Jersey City. Um, before she died, she took the Concord many times. She had a cell phone, she had a laptop. Um, you know, in, in one generation changed the whole world. And now that's going to happen in one decade. And how we respond, it's not clear. You look at social media, it sounds like it's great. But I think if you go back and you say, wouldn't it be wonderful if everybody was, had all the news in the world accessible to them? And it sounds great, yeah. Except that we found that's not the case because it silos people to get down to own individual sources. They've reduced their consumption to 140 characters and it's kind of hard to do complex things in 140 characters. And so some of these things that we think are for the good aren't necessarily, don't turn out that way. Uh, and I think we know less about what we're doing even though we have more information at our fingertips uh, in the schools, we are not, we're siloing everybody, uh, you're 100% right. Uh, one of the things uh, in my alma mater, uh, Johns Hopkins, the president had this brilliant idea that we would go and hire 50 new professors. Of course, he needed some money to do it, you know what happened there. But, um, but, but he'd hired 50, we'd hire 50 new professors, but they had to have appointments in two different departments. And they could pick any department throughout the school, so you could be in the classics and be a nuclear scientist. And that has been phenomenally successful, and others are starting to copy it. And if you're in the architecture school uh, at, at some place, having also to get an appointment in the liberal arts, fac for the liberal arts fac faculty or the engineering faculty, those kinds of things, we just have to force ourselves out of these silos. Whether you can do it downstream or not, I don't know. But uh, at our level, you certainly should be able to do it, except we're all stuck in the same thing. We want to protect ourselves and our cohorts and our traditions, and we work so hard to get to one place, and why dilute that? There's no easy answer here. So does it mean, Norman Foster, that it's more difficult being an architect now than it was 30 years ago, G given the change of pace, the fact that it's going so quickly? I, I, I think that really when we go through a school of architecture and we're trained to believe that we can design a building in isolation, uh, I think we have to uh, reinvent ourselves. I think in, in, in the real world, um, the, the power of, of different disciplines interacting uh, is the point that I made earlier. I think it's too important for, for, for one, prof one profession. Um, and, um, and it's not only more exciting, but the end result is going to be more integrated, is going to uh, be you know, a higher performance product. Ricky? No, I think the, the only point to perhaps raise on this is that um, people who enter today, let's call it public service in the city, particularly in Europe and particularly in North America, do not see it as a great thing to do. It's, 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 not, it's not the most exciting thing to do in life. And what I was struck by some of the cases in Latin America when visiting the city is that actually it's a great honor. You may not be paid so much, but it's a great honor that you can think you can transition, you can make a change in a short period of time. So I think putting those pieces of the jigsaw 
together, not just for the designers, but also for the next generation represented in this room of civic leaders is what it's about. I think there's also in Spain um, a stronger tradition of people moving from the design field into the political field. Uh, certainly um, projects like the Bilbao Metro, um, which is a beautiful model. I mean, uh, you know, the UK has been talking about a northern powerhouse and the importance of connecting the cities there to bring prosperity and to create wealth. They talk about it, but it's act that, and I instance the Bilbao Metro, and the Bilbao Metro was um, uh, in large part created by the kind of migration of those who would be practicing architecture in private practice to, uh, to enable things like that, that to happen in the political domain. So I think that, that the importance of, of coming out of the design professions is, is the potential to move into the political domain. And I think the challenge is, to, is to have, for that to have the same prestige as operating in the private sector. Yeah, one of the things that we found really worked was to get young people to come to work in city government with the promise of after they got experience, we would help them move into the private sector where they could have a more lucrative, maybe less satisfying, maybe not, career. Uh, but to make it a stepping stone and get the value of all of their energy and enthusiasm and, and belief that anything's possible and it didn't work with everybody, but it did work. And, and uh, Patty Harris, who's here, was the first deputy mayor, a guy named Bob Steele who came from Goldman Sachs. Uh, people like that, Dan Doctoroff did it. They brought in young people, worked the heck out of them, and then moved them on into the private sector and brought the next group in. So I think you can make public service exciting and satisfying, but you're right. If people think of government as just a bureaucracy that stops everything, no. But you can get bureaucracies if you can convince the people that it's, it's in their interest. In the end, everybody's selfish. So you've got to convince the people that work on the bureaucracies that it's good for their career, they'll, they'll be more proud at home, they'll have, be able to make more money or go do something else. And I can just tell you, they have been, having been in government and in business, in uh, business, everybody thinks in government, uh, uh, government is lazy and dumb. In government, everybody, in, uh, government, everybody thinks in business is a crook. Neither is true. There's the same percentage of innovative, hardworking, dedicated people who give their all in both. And there's the same percentage of people who are at the other end of the spectrum. And um, we don't have a lock on, uh, on, on either one. My, um, to that end, it's, it's sort of, I think of a city as a learning lab and as an experimental lab. I think it takes guts from a leader to be willing to do things that might be unpopular, which at times we, we, we're sorely lacking in, in leaders that are willing to take risks that way. Once that's done, and I think I'm a firm believer in the case study method, the city becomes that perfect microcosm of integration. So you can study transit energy, building efficiency, waste and recycling, at which point the lessons that we've learned, and I think people are thinking climate change, it's, it's a huge issue, how do we tackle it? By showing people that it's being done, whether it's C40, I it's incredible, we've had a renaissance in our cities and the power is there, and to showcase that and to learn from that right. is a huge, right. a huge I, I'm problem. very optimistic on America, for example, I think this make America great again, spare me of the again, America is still one of the, the great country in the world. It's where people go when they vote with their feet. But Winston Churchill once said, once said that you can depend on America to do the right thing after exhausting all other possibilities. <laughs> we are at the moment in the exhaustion period. Um, Maya, you're very uh, focused, of course, on the environment, wildlife, right. and, and the wetlands. Is it just a problem for rich countries? Why um, should everyone think about not it? Not at all. And I think Hank will speak to that later. Um, literally, it is one of the most economic, least expensive ways to begin. And there really is conversation now about nature-based solutions uh, that, that really are almost go hand in hand with reducing our consumption, our energy, our, our usage, but 
by absorbing CO2 out of the atmosphere, which as oceans acidify, we're going to have to, or they are acidifying, that we're going to have to do something that, and the potential to use photosynthesis, and it's being done all around the world, um, and absolutely it, it can help economies, you know, create jobs, as well as protect us. No, this problem is certainly not just concentrated in the global north. Uh, if you take one of Norman's slides on the left-hand side when he showed the Los Angeles model rather than the New York or the Manhattan model in terms of density, unfortunately, whatever we say here, whatever designers think is the right sort of thing, most of the cities that are being built around the world or being expanded are having serious middle age spread. I mean, they're going uh, horizontal. Um, in 250 cities, this is a study done by New York University recently, populations roughly have doubled in about 15 years. Double. That's, that's an enormous amount. You, you saw Norman's Madrid example in China. But populations have doubled, but in these 250 cities, the footprint has gone up by five times. So in terms of eating up mm -hmm. the, the green, right. simplifying it in orbit, in terms of the cost on infrastructure, sewers, uh, electricity and everything else, but also just taking up the valuable and breaking up that ecosystem is absolutely terrible, including the effect on social fabric. People feel distant. Right. I mean, I think I, I use the phrase sprawl up. And if you can look at our suburbs and our, our, our metropolitan areas that are incredibly spread out, and again, every, every country is unique, the potential to say, well, I don't want to live in a high rise, but the reality is if you look at a low rise three story with the shared parkway, which mm -hmm. starts in Europe, it's an incredible way to create community. One of the arguments about suburbia in this country, at least, is um, it takes like someone living in the suburbs, they spend two to three years of their life waiting in traffic. So I always say, is that really freedom of the car, or do we want freedom from the car? And I think that is the education of, in a way, the designers, the urban planners, to begin to really show, well, this is what Atlanta could sh you know, shrink its footprint a little. We can pull in. Um, Detroit might, there's been a lot of discussion about Detroit. What do you do with all the abandoned spaces? How do you deal with urban infill? How are you going to begin? And I think these are the questions that face any designer in the room, um, urban planners, leaders, that we have an opportunity again. And I'll say it's an opportunity to begin to kind of rethink how we live. Yeah, remember that uh, Norman's slide pointed out that people are moving into cities. And the reason they're moving into cities is because that's where the action is, that's where the opportunity is. And I've always thought that um, capital will, uh, culture will bring capital a lot faster than capital will bring culture. So the ways to make your city better, and you can see it starting in Detroit, a basket case in America, falling apart totally. There's an arts community starting to move in, and then eventually the middle class, the yuppies will move in, make it too pricey for the artists, and they'll go someplace <laughs> else. But it, that's the natural evolution. And it's happened in New York City in new, different neighborhoods that were just basket cases themselves. Nobody wanted to live there. It wasn't safe. And today, everybody becomes hot and everybody wants to live there. Uh, we still have the benefit of the rivers that keep us in the bay, that keeps us focused in. Uh, but you can, if you want to have a more exciting life, a healthier life, there are more people that move to New York City to retire than leave. Why? Because the services are there. If you're a senior, you can walk to the corner to your shopping. The ambulance can get there if you need them quickly. Um, you know, you, it, there's this awful lot of free things to go and to do, and you can take the subway to, or bus to get there. Um, and so there really is a big value. Now, not everybody understands that. Everybody says, well, I want more green space. Okay, that's why cities should build um, things like the Hudson River Park and, and Central Park and Brooklyn Bridge Park and Van Cortlandt and all of these other parks. But there's an awful lot to be said for living in cities. And in fact, the, when we left office, life expectancy in New York City was three years greater than in the rest of the country. Think about that. For all the pollution you talk about, all the crime you talk about, all the pace of living you talk about, all the stress and strain and whatever, 
if you have friends that live in America and you want them to live longer, get them to move to New York City. And on average, I can't tell you everyone will, but if you have a big enough group of friends, yes, they will. And that's because we, we, we think about some of these things as not... You know. and, and it's the same challenge for Madrid. I would rather live in Madrid I'm a city guy, and I would rather live in Madrid, Madrid where everything's there, and I can go, and I can walk to it, and I can do it, and I would want my kids to grow up in the city rather than in the suburbs. But, but the, the big challenge, and you, you had to face this in New York, is that even though you live longer, the difference between living on one side and the other can be enormous in one city. So London, oh. if you are brought up in West London, and you take the underground, and you go east, every stop you take, you lose one year in life expectancy. One year. Yeah. Now, I bet you, in Madrid, there's something similar. Well, I'd in like to say to our president, we don't have to make America great again. What we have to do is make America accessible to more of its right. citizens, and that's where we've fallen back, and that's what we have to do. So Norman's call for design and linking transport and equity and planning is to deal with these things holistically and not think of it as a technical uh, issue, but actually a fundamental social. So climate change helps because it puts all these things on the agenda. We, we hope it helps, even though most defense departments around the world about 15 years ago said it's going to be one of our main drivers for unrest, which if you look at Syria, it's, you know, it's one of the compounding problems. It was a three-year drought. And I think we as a society, you know, we're kind of more global in a way, but when push comes to shove, when resources are at stake, civilizations have tended to go tribal. And I think we're at that cusp where we either come together and solve this, which is eminently solvable, we're proving that, or are we going to fight? We're almost out of time, so I'm just going to ask you one final question each. And Mike, I'm going to start with you. The forum is called Futures Now. We have a lot of students watching, possible future mayors or architects. What would be your number one word of advice to them on how they should look at their future? Oh, get a, get a broad education, but make sure you understand the sciences and math. Uh, energy is going to be basically free, um, so that's not going to be a constraint but it, this, it's going to be more competitive as we go forward because technology is reducing the number of jobs and you've got to find something that will satisfy you that um, can also support you. And what I don't like is all these kids going from job to job to job. Uh, I grew up in a world where you got a job and you'd stay there forever because in good times there'd be no reason to leave and in bad times you have an obligation, I've always thought, to stay with your employer and help them through tough times. Today kids are jumping and jumping and our school systems are protecting them from learning how to deal with difficulty and failure and uh, we're, not doing what, we're not doing a service to our kids but they've got to somehow or other find a ways to get that education even if we don't want to give it to them. Norman? It's the same theme, it's about education, whether that's self-education um, and, uh, and attitude. And, um, and if you really believe in a better future, uh, then a better future will, will follow from it. But it is, it's a combination of attitude, awareness, um, um, education. Ricky? Well, apart from affordable and high-quality schools near where they are needed, which New York and London, for example, are terrible at, right? we need affordable and high-quality housing where they are needed, not pushed out to the edge. And if we have to pay a bit more tax, so be it. Maya? Um, just never, you know, never stop learning. Always stay extremely curious. Um, think outside of the box as much as you can but also think holistically, think of integrated system problem solving methods. I think we have gone through industrialization, we specialized, and now we're beginning to really understand how we problem solve in an integrated whole. Remain a student. <laughs> Thank you so much for a great conversation. Thank you.